All right, boys and girls, welcome back to Pediatrics. We shall be talking about respiratory distress syndrome, all right? I bet you've heard of it, this disease before, but let's talk about exactly what the step two wants you to know about this disease. So respiratory distress syndrome, also known as RDS, used to be called hyaline membrane disease. Now, this is a disease that's the most common. Now, when you hear me say most common, always remember that's what the board wants to test you on. The most common cause of respiratory failure in neonates is respiratory distress syndrome. So, let's see. This often occurs in infants at preterm between 28 to 30 weeks. 28 to 30 weeks infant which means this kid is not supposed to be born yet, right? Normal babies should be born around 37, 38 weeks. But if a baby comes out before then, you know nothing good can really come out because you, there's gonna be some mechanical problems in that baby. In this case, we're talking about the lungs. Now, imagine this baby being born at 28 weeks, or let's even say 30 weeks, and even the board exam, that's why you gotta pay attention to the dates, all right? Pay attention to the sex, pay attention to the race, pay attention to the time, all right? In this case, if they tell you a 30 week infant was born, you better be thinking respiratory distress syndrome. Is that gonna be something wrong in the first 48 to 72 hours? 48 to 72 hours. So they're describing a the child that's born in the first two to three days and they start to have some respiratory problems, it's respiratory distress syndrome. Now, we gotta go over the pathophysiology because there's no way we're gonna understand RDS without going over basic physiology. So normally inside the alveoli in the lungs, what do we have? We have surfactant and it's made by the type two pneumocytes. Now what is surfactant? What's the big deal about surfactant? Well, surfactant is basically made out of DPPC, which is dipalmitoyl phosphatidylcholine. Whoo, that was a mouthful, right? But in this case, this surfactant, its job is to decrease surface tension, which means when that baby takes a deep breath and blow it out, that alveoli expands and then tries to come down, a decrease in size, right? But it does not go all the way down. It does not collapse on itself, why? Because you have that surfactant uh, in there, which is helping primarily to decrease the intermolecular forces inside the alveoli, right? Between those liquid molecules inside the alveoli, all right? Which means it prevents the alveoli from collapsing. So every time a baby breathes, you don't want your alveoli collapsing, right? Because think about it. Think about how much work it's going to take if we, every time the baby takes a deep breath, or take a breath, it doesn't even matter, and the alveoli collapse completely. It's going to take a lot of work to pop it open, and then it's going to collapse again. That's not good. So you want residual volume. You always want that little bit of residual volume left inside the alveoli. So when the alveoli basically expands, and then collapse on the end of expirations, there's still a bit of space, and that is what surfactant does. It decreases surface tension, thus increasing the compliance of the lungs and preventing collapse of the alveoli. Now, how do we know that this baby that's born has a normal or matured surfactant? Well, what you want to check is known as the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio. And if it's greater than two to one, that is a mature surfactant. You are ready to come to the world, baby, and breathe on your own because you don't have to depend on mother's oxygen from the umbilical cord anymore. Now, what happens in RDS? Because we now understand basic physiology and normal physiology. Now this is pathology. Lack of surfactant is the pathophysiology behind respiratory distress syndrome. These babies, these neonates are born to the world and they don't have surfactant. But that's not good because there's no surfactant in the lung. Every time they take a breath, that lung is going to collapse. The fancy word for a collapsed lung in medicine is atelectasis, right? Hydrolectasis. So you're probably like, what's, what's the big deal with hydrolectasis? So what the, the lungs is collapsing on this kid? That's not good. That is not good at all. Because once the lungs collapse, it takes a lot of energy to reinflate that lung because there's no surfactant to keep it open. All right? Now, 
If there's no, if there's iliac disease, you're gonna have low compliance, right? The, com the compliance of the lung is gonna be low because the surface tension is higher because there's no surfactant in the lung. Now, if the lung collapses, well, let's see. Normally, how do we get air into the lungs? All right, let's go back to basic physiology. You take in oxygen, and oxygen goes into the alveoli, right? Eventually, through the uh, bronchial and the terminal bronchioles, and then you get to the alveoli, right? Now, this oxygen's got to diffuse through this uh, alveoli into the interstitial space and end up in the pulmonary capillaries. And then we got oxygenated blood that goes into the pulmonary vessels. But check this out. Carbon dioxide's got to come out and diffuse, right, from all the use from the tissues and basically has to exit. So that's normal. Now, what happens to a collapsed lung is this. Here's the blood vessel. Right, the blood vessel is bringing carbon dioxide, right? It's bringing a lot of CO2, and it gets to this destination to get the CO2 passed into the alveoli, and guess what? The CO2 gets trapped inside the alveoli because it's collapsed, right? And what happens with oxygen? Well, oxygen cannot come in, right? It's a collapsed alveoli, so oxygen is having a hard time coming, CO2 is trapped on the inside. Well, that is hypercapnia. We've got too much CO2 in the lungs of a newborn. Well, we're going to talk about what we're going to see on ABG later on. But this is what leads to hypoxemia, low oxygen in the blood. Because the lungs, and think about it, there's millions of them. That's not just one. Millions of alveoli all collapse. So this little pointy, tiny little baby is trying to get air into his lungs. And he can't because oxygen can't get through. They become hypoxemic. What does that lead to? Decreased ventilation to perfusion ratio, right? Because the VQ ratio is going to be abnormal because there's too much CO2 in the lungs. There's perfusion, but there is no ventilation. There's no ventilation. That's going to lead to decreased VQ ratio. So, what are the risk factors? On the boards, they want you to know this. When they talk about a neonate, a 29-week uh, neonate, that was born to a infant, uh, to a mother who a mother has a history of diabetes. They're giving it away. That is the risk factor for respiratory distress syndrome. It's a, it's a, it's always usually a male, and sometimes it could be a second born of twins. Those are all the three risk factors you need to know for the boards. Now, how can I flip this question? If I'm a question writer, I want to switch this question on you. I describe a, a, a case of a baby with respiratory distress syndrome. And I said, which of the following is a risk factor for developing this disease? So this entire time, I told her they're 28 weeks, right? Their mother, you know, uh, their, it's a male child is born with respiratory distress. They're hypoxemic, hypercapnic, and we talk about some of the signs and symptoms. Which of the following risk factors? You better know maternal diabetes is a risk factor. That is how they can turn it around right on you, despite the fact they give you the diagnosis in these cases. So now that we know the risk factors, we understand the pathophysiology. What do you see on history and physical exam? So this is a new, newborn that's been born. What's going to happen when a child has so much, uh, uh, a neonate has so much CO2 build up in their lungs, their lungs are collapsed, right? And they can't get air in. Well, their respiratory rate is, it's going to increase their respiratory drive because they're going to get respiratory acidosis. But because of that, they're going to need to increase their respiratory rate. It's going to be greater than 60, right? They're hypercapnic and they are going to be tachypnic. That's what they're going to start off with. But as they become tachypnic, because they're trapping all the CO2 and all their lungs are collapsed and they basically try to recruit as much as they can, but they can't get enough recruitment, they're going to get progressive hypoxemia. Slowly and slowly, you know, CO2 builds up, oxygen can't get in, and they get hypoxemic. So you see their pulse ox is going to be low, right? Maybe their pulse ox is 80%. Not good. But what happens to a child that have too much CO2 in the lungs? They're going to have cyanosis. Very simple, right? If you don't have oxygen in your blood, the blood is going to turn, you're going to look blue. That is cyanosis because that's too much carbon dioxide. Now, because of all the symptoms, this child is going to have nasal flaring. Like their nose are kind of flaring up because they are working extremely hard to, hard to pop open this collapsed alveoli. They're really working hard, but it can't. Remember, babies are very small.
Also, they're going to have intercostal retraction. This is what happens to babies when they are in respiratory distress, okay? They get intercostal retractions because now not, you know, you and I use the diaphragm to breathe. That's normal, right? You take a deep breath and breathe out. It's a nice little recall. You don't have to work. But the moment the lungs collapse, there is increased work of breathing, you're gonna start using your scaling muscles, the intercostal muscle of the chest, the abdominal muscles, rectus pectoral, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the abdominal muscles, and that means more work just to get air into the lungs, all right? So we're gonna talk about the nasal flaring. And finally, they're gonna have expiratory grunting, all right? Those are the signs and symptoms you're gonna see in this patient on physical exam. So how do you make this diagnosis? This is a clinical diagnosis because if you know it's a preterm baby, right, and they have an increased work of breathing, you should be thinking respiratory distress syndrome. But what you want to first do is check an ABG, an arterial blood gas in this neonate. And when you check your ABG, what do you expect to find? Well, we already gave it away. This child is retaining a lot of CO2, a CO2 retainer. What's going to happen to CO2 level? It's going to skyrocket. What's going to happen to the pH? It's going to be low. So this child is going to have respiratory acidosis, respiratory acidosis. So they can give you that, you know, PCO2 of 60 or a pH of 7.1. You say, oh, wow, I got a kid with respiratory acidosis. That is not good. For also, you want to rule out infection. Check a CBC to make sure there's no elevated white blood cell count and a blood culture to make sure this child doesn't have an underlying infection while they're coming in, all right? Because that can also mask tachypnea in the newborn. Remember, the most important thing is a clinical diagnosis, but you want to confirm with a chest x-ray. And what you're going to see on chest x-ray is the ground glass appearance on the chest x-ray. And because I told you all their lungs are collapsed, you're going to see diffuse atelectasis and air bronchograms in this baby's chest x-ray. So what gives it away? How are you going to treat this baby? Well, you want to put them on a CPAP. CPAP is actually a continuous positive airway pressure. It's basically a little machine you put it on the baby's nose like it's a nose seal. Putting the patient on CPAP, we allow you, the machine to push air into the lungs to pop open those collapsed alveoli. That's why we place these patients on CPAP. Unfortunately, if the patient is on CPAP and they're still hypoxemic, right, their pulse ox is not in improving, what you want to do is go ahead and intubate the child, okay, put an endotracheal tube down into their trachea and basically intubate them and put them on a mechanical ventilation to allow the ventilator to basically uh, uh, open up the lungs and allow them to ventilate out of that CO2 and basically give them oxygen to be able to maintain that child's O2 saturation. Also, remember this child has no surfactant. So remember, you have to give them artificial surfactant because this decreases mortality. If the mother actually already has an increased risk of developing a preterm delivery, all right, so you want to pre-treat these mothers. So if you're like, oh, you know, this, if you're telling the child the mother's already at risk, right, it's a diabetic mother, all right. So if they're less than 30 weeks, we treat with corticosteroids. If they are greater than 30 weeks, you want to check the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio and this phosphatidyl glycerol in the amniotic fluid. Remember, if that LS ratio is less than 2 to 1 ratio, you have to treat that mother with glucocorticoids. Very, very high yield. They love to test you on that. So if you're saying the mother, uh, the baby is less than 30 weeks, all right, and basically they have a respiratory distress syndrome, and you check the LS ratio and it's less than in the amniotic fluid, you have to treat that mother with glucocorticoids. Corticoids, all right. Also, we need to talk about some other syndromes that can present with tachypnea in a newborn. One of them is known as transient tachypnea of the newborn, all right. Transient tachypnea of the newborn. Well, this is actually happens in neonates that basically uh, asp uh, um, has retained amniotic fluid inside their lungs that's basically what leads to uh, ttp all right uh, uh, ttn trans transient trachypnea of the newborn and usually often results in prominent perihilar streaking in the interlobular fissures but in, in transient trachypnea you just give oxygen that's all you need to give oxygen you give them oxygen they get better all right now also the child can also aspirate meconium
or to meconium. That's the baby's poop, all right? If that child aspirated meconium while it's getting delivered, all right, you're going to see coarse irregular infiltrate inside the, the, the chest extra of the patient's lungs, and they have hyperextension, and they can develop pneumothorax, okay? So that's another thing, that, another uh, syndrome that the child can also develop. And last but not the least is congenital pneumonia, all right? Babies can, it's usually not, appears as non-specific patchy infiltrate. They are neutropenic and they have tricky aspirates and often the gram stain is what gives the diagnosis away. Remember, that's why I told you that we have to check the CBC and blood cultures because if they have pneumonia uh, being born as a newborn baby, they're going to get treated with anti antibiotics. All right. Now, there are complications <clears throat> to respiratory distress syndrome that we need to cover in this lecture. The first one is these patients can have persistent PDA, right? Remember they're born at 30 weeks, so they're going to have a pit and ductus arteriosus because remember when a newborn baby is born, all right, the first thing that happens when they're taking oxygen in is that closure of the pit and ductus arteriosus, all right, to form the ligamentous arteriosus, all right, to prevent shunting of blood into the aorta, all right, into in, yeah, between the aorta and the lungs, all right. So, because the baby is uh, already born prior to um, uh, normal term, they're going to have persistent PDA. Also, they can develop bronchopulmonary dysplasia and retinopathy of prematurity. The reason is because Oxygen can cause retin uh, retinopathy of the eyes uh, pr uh, premature because it's, uh, uh, it can form oxygen radicals, okay, and it can also damage the lungs, all right? Putting these patients on CPAP also has its own complications, all right? There's no free lunch. CPAP can try to open up the closed alveoli, but then you can burst them open and cause barotrauma, and then they can develop pneumothorax, okay? So that, that, that's another complication that can re result from um, RDS. Also, last but not least, they can develop intraventricular hemorrhage and necrotizing enterocolitis. Because remember, child that are born early, as they go through the birth canal, can also crush your skull. They can develop intraventricular hemorrhage. And if they develop infections inside the uh, neonatal ICU, they can also develop necrotizing enterocolitis from translocation of bacteria inside their bowel wall, which can cause air between the bowel wall, okay, which leads to pneumatosis intestinalis. That's just because they are preterm babies. That preterm babies are predisposed to these complications in general. All right, so let's wrap up this lecture and basically summarize it. All right, RDS, very simple to understand. Respiratory distress syndrome in neonates, right? because they don't have surfactant. Surfactant basically allows, the, it prevents the airway from closing, but the problem is if you don't have it, it gets closed. If you close your fist and you, can, you can't get oxygen through those alveoli, oxygen can go in, CO2 is trapped in, they become hypercapnic, respiratory distress, right? That's why they're tachypnic, all right? You put them on CPAP, you wanna just blow it back open. If you can't get that done, make sure you put in some artificial surfactant and give it to the patient, or make sure you treat their mother also with corticosteroids if their LS ratio is less than 2 to 1 ratio, okay? And last but not the least, remember to put them on CPAP or intubate them if you cannot uh, maintain their oxygen saturation due to decreased VQ ratio. That brings us to the end of our lecture on respiratory distress.